Welcome. Uh, this is a, it's a special meeting because we have a gavel for me to uh, call to order the uh, December 14th meeting of the CSUC Board of Directors. Um, the first item is going to be the Native Land Acknowledgement. And the purpose of a land acknowledgement is really to acknowledge someone and to say, I see you, you are significant. And the purpose of a land acknowledgement is to recognize and pay respect to the original inhabitants of a specific region. It's an opportunity to express gratitude and appreciation for those whose territory you now exist in. And the CSCC land acknowledgement goes like this. CSCC would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land our campuses reside on are the original homelands of the Wasco, or Wasco and the Wanalama, or the Warm Springs people. They ceded this land to the U.S. government in the Treaty of 1855. The Numu, or the Paiute, people were forcibly moved to the Warm Springs Indian Reservation starting in 1879. It's also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celilo Falls trading ground, and the Klamath tribes claim it as their own. Descendants of these original people are thriving members of our communities today. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. The next item is uh, roll call. I'm uh, calling roll Bruce Abernethy. Yes. Joe Penman. Yes, uh, Alan Hunter. Yes, Scott Erica Montgomery. Uh, Jim Clinton. Jim, do I need that? Oliver Tatum. Present. Yeah. Jim, I'm going to need you. We're going to need that. There we go. Um, Lori Chesley. Here. Alicia Moore. Bonnie. Here. Zach Hyman. And Ray Hamlin. Sorry, Jim. I'm going to need you because we're getting some feedback. There we go. <laughs> um, Mark Reinecke. Here. Kathleen Houston. Here. Uh, Jeff Boyd. Here. Darren Cray. Here. Jeremy Green, yep. uh, Jennifer Cobus, uh, present, and then uh, later on tonight we'll have uh, Allison Black. Great, thank you very much. I don't think I said, here, did my name get called? And I just missed it? Yes. Oh, I'm here, sorry. There was like background noise and my daughter was asking me something. So I'm here, thank you, sorry. Thank you, Erica, no problem. Uh, are there any agenda changes that I need to know about? Next item is public comment. Anyone on that side? Uh, not submitted in advance. Any Great. I'm going to take this time. Uh, public comment is typically a time when we have an opportunity to hear from you, the public, the broader community, the people who really care about and support this institution. Uh, tonight, I want to use some of this time to talk to you and acknowledge the recent passing of William Bill Smith, a longtime champion of the college and a pioneer in so many ways in shaping the development and the culture of Bend and Central Oregon. On behalf of the college, I wanna offer our condolences to his wife, Trish, his daughter, Marnie, his son, Matt, his beloved cat, Teen, and to all the employees at William Smith Properties, Inc and offer a heartfelt thank you to Bill for his many, many years of partnership and support. Thank you. Moving on to the consent agenda. Everyone had a chance to do that. Anything people want to nitpick about the minutes? <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I so move. Moved, is there a second? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Say no, nay. Passes. Moving on to the information items, uh, financial statements. Kathleen, um, this is in our, in our packet. Any questions, comments? Alan. When did we get our property tax money? It seems like it's been more than 30 days. For the college? Yeah. 
Shouldn't the county be given a sum? It's, say that again. Property tax money. Shouldn't there has be it been re has it been received by the college yet? Is that your question? Well, yeah, it isn't listed. I don't see it on the on the you know on these. Oh, okay. Yeah, they they typically come in. Um, we get monthly installments from different counties. Um, the minutes or the information that we are presenting here, I think it's as of September. Is oh. that correct? October. October. Like October. So um, I can definitely yeah. check to see what our status is as of December and get that information to you. Okay. I mean, Alan, you're not really saying I need the details. You're simply no. saying it's totally fine if it's not in October. He wants to have you gotten the check? That's. <laughs> he doesn't need to. <laughs> Now, or is there going to be any delay? Is that, is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. That's all. yeah I, I'm not concerned about any delay, but I can definitely, I've been out on maternity leave, so I don't know up to date. Um, but yeah, I, feel I don't think there's a concern for receiving the, the property tax money. Okay. Good we'll question now. What was in there? <laughs> <laughs> you finally get a chance to talk and interact with us, and all we're doing is giving you a hard time. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. No problem. Um, the next item is uh, new hire reports. Anyone have any questions for Laura? Great. Next slide. To, next up is a presentation about IT and cybersecurity by Jeff Floyd and Darren McCray. Good evening. My name is Jeff Floyd, and I am the director of technology support services for the ITS department. Uh, I'm lead off batter tonight for the ITS presentation. Uh, feel free to jump in with any questions as we go along. We're going to try and keep this kind of casual. The intent of this presentation is to give you an idea of what ITS is doing to help the college fulfill its mission and provide students with the tools they need to help them be successful. I love it when IT has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> That is throwing me off at all. So the mission of the ITS department is to provide quality instructional technology and information resources to students, faculty, and staff in support of student success and community enrichment. Along with our mission, this slide contains some vision information, some highlights that we're going to be discussing throughout the presentation. The ITS department is made up of three general areas. We have the technology support services, which comprise of the engineer support, engineering, and networking team. The enterprise information services, which is made up of enterprise application management, enterprise system administration, web development, and security. And then under the office of the CIO, we have the functional analysts, admin support, video production, project management, and student technology services, and of course, the CIO, Gordon. Student technology services have been up and running for over a year now and really hitting its stride, helping students with a wide range of issues. As you can see by this slide, the big comparison to the fall of 2021 and fall of 2022, 
the ticket counts are down slightly, there are still a lot of students out there looking for answers to some of their everyday technology problems here at the college. With the processes that have been developed and put in place, tickets are closed more quickly this year, and most issues are being handled in real time. Communications have also been enhanced due to the implementation of new phone system configuration, allowing calls to be answered at primary and secondary locations, and allowing multiple attendants to provide help to students. Also, at this time, a new online web chat tool is being piloted, providing students with a notable way of communicating with types and personnel in real time. So we can see ticket counts are down slightly. Um, and then the different categories of the tickets are over here. They're, they're pretty much the same as they were last year. The other category is a little bit bigger. Can you give me an example, just a couple examples of what would fall into that given that it didn't make it into the other categories? What would be other? Because it looks like it's about 25, no, 20% maybe. Right. So maybe another question would be, can't see my grades. My grades haven't posted okay. yet. What do I do? Well, in that case, we would switch <clears throat> into uh, the mission and the records so they can provide them some information for that. Um, another instance might be I don't what's that transcript requests. Transcript requests. I can't find the pioneer building. Great. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of we there's a lot of calls to come in for. Things that just don't fit in the whole part. Okay. So, I accidentally deleted all my emails. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that got in green. That's, that's going green. Oh, that's, that's green. green. That's that's green. Green. Oh, it's not yeah. about us. Or we, or we might say, you know, that might just need to be. Just out of curiosity, the password. Uh, you think to what's hard about the password change? So sometimes you forget your password, believe it or not. So you have to write a ticket to get a new password? No, so that would be handled in, in real time. But even though we do handle things in real time, we still submit a ticket. Okay. So we can follow trends and stuff like that. Thank you. That's a good question, Joe, because I would have. So in some cases, you're saying the ticket is done after the fact as well, or concurrently as opposed Oh, absolutely. Okay. I, I, that wasn't obvious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. At least let's put it this way. It's supposed to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the big wins for the ITS, ITS department this last year was the completely revamped student printing experience. Uh, the, part, the department leveraged the same system that staff utilizes to print copiers throughout the campus and enhanced it to help students find a more friendly print experience at CLCC. Before with the old system, the only way that a student could pay for printing was with cash. We all know that students don't carry around much cash these days. I, believe it or not, I've even got to the point where I don't carry around much cash. It was a long adventure that I finally got there too. Um, so the new system allows students to utilize their credit cards for printing and provide a much more streamlined process. So that's the win for students. The win for the college is the old system cost us approximately $5,000 a year in licensing fees. Since we are leveraging a system that we already have that we utilize for staff to print the copiers, we don't incur those license fees anymore, so it saves us five grand a year. So, went for students, went for the college. Went for the student. Um, as you can see, the majority of printing happens at the Barber Library, 86%. That's definitely the majority. Uh, and then there's uh, printing that happens you know, throughout the locations of the other campuses and, and the college. Um, down here, we have a breakdown of how this printing is paid for. 81% uh, is debit and credit. We still do accept cash. So a student can come up, give us cash, and we will put credits into their account so that they can print. Um, and then the GP is the old GoPrint system. That's the old system. If you have an old GoPrint card, you walk up and say, hey, I still got this. It doesn't work anymore. And they go, no problem. We look it up. We'll give you that those credits to your account, so so you don't lose that. So does, is this service available in Madras yet? Yes, everyone. Residence hall network update. 
the year behind us providing network services to the residence hall, we can report that we have a stable and highly used system. The primary thing that we learned in the last year is that people will plug or try and connect anything that they can at any given time, whether they should or not. <laughs> Most things play nice with our system, while others require some tweaking to help them along the way. Tweaking being the technical team. Student services provides great frontline support with technology issues within the residence hall. And then they pass along other problems that they can't completely figure out to the network team. Uh, one of the things that's helped us out along the way that we do is on move-in day, we'll have a table down there. Um, and students can come up and ask us questions about being on the network. There are different pieces of equipment that they have to hook up. Just general questions that they may have. We've also extended that to have that table there on day two, because we find that it's a little crazy down there on day one. The students are coming in and out, people are moving, things are going on. So, so day two has actually been <coughs> probably been more helpful to us because we have students wandering around the lobby and they'll come up and start to chat with us. The college committed to a pretty substantial cost in the beginning to set up the residence hall network and provide these services to students in-house. Uh, our total five-year cost is estimated to be about $275,000. Uh, with our previous vendor contract, we were paying close to a million dollars over five years. Uh, so after approximately February of 2023, which is coming up, it's all gravy at that point. So we still have personnel time that we have to put forward in order to fix issues, make sure equipment's running correctly, handle calls and stuff like that. But it's still a pretty substantial savings that we're getting. And, and it seems that you know we're, we're getting better at providing that service. And although we didn't, we weren't a company in the beginning that provided rest hall network services, at, at, at this point, we, we seem to be providing that kind of service. <laughs> I, I, that's really exciting. I, I remember when we had that discussion of whether we thought we had the capacity and expertise in house to do it. Um, I'm glad we made the decision we did, and I'm glad you guys have ably implemented it. I'm glad too. It's one of the hard things that I think we've taken on. And be correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't have new positions to do this. So we had here we had a unit who came and said, we're willing to take on more work and we're not asking for more positions and we believe we can do this and save the college money. You, know, you hate it when that happens, right? I just <laughs> they are out of control. Yeah. I'm just telling you. But I mean, that's not um it's not always coming. Yeah, last <clears throat> the summer before we started was was a really hard push. Uh, getting everything installed and, and set up. That was that was kind of pretty crazy months. And and we we did get lucky because we started that kind of at the uh, at the tail end of when the supply chain was really becoming starting to become crazy. We were able to get stuff kind of, uh, but we were able to follow through on that. And, and once we got it built and up and running and we were able to get through this first year, at that point, it, it became a lot easier for us to, to, to get in and have students show up and get the equipment and the devices set up. And so. Streaming classrooms. In 2019, or excuse me, another area where we had a substantial amount of growth is in remote learning or streaming classrooms. The ITS department, along with e-learning, has worked to design in, and install a number of new classrooms utilizing this technology. In 2019, we had three conference rooms with webcams, and we call those Skype rooms. <laughs> they were impressive. At this time, we have 25 spaces that can be utilized for teaching between campuses or for staff collaboration. This has given us the ability to reach a greater number of students and save many hours of travel for staff. So a typical streaming classroom, as is depicted in this picture, this is HCC 330. So this is one of the, the big ones. 
but most classes will set up in the same way. So the, the classes will have two cameras in them, one facing the class, so the remote students can see the actual class. And then one facing the teaching area, which picks up the teacher, faculty member, the projection screen or the whiteboard, whatever you like to teach. Uh, we also have two screens, um, one that will be projecting the remote class so the faculty member can see that other class and be able to interact with them. Um, we also have a competence monitor, which will, which if I was standing right here, I would be looking at that competence monitor in order to make sure that the remote class is seeing what I want them to see, that I am in the picture, that I can utilize the whiteboard and the screen, and that I have confidence in myself that I am projecting back into the classroom. So do instructors need to stay within a certain you know, range of in within the classroom, or does the does the camera follow them? So how we approach that is we can have a camera system that could follow them. We don't just do the cost mm -hmm. that pumps that up a lot. Um, what we do is we have presets on those cameras that the instructor can utilize with the remote. So let's say I'm utilizing this white whiteboard right now. I have that preset, that camera preset set for that. Let's say I want to go over to the next whiteboard over here. I hit the preset on the camera. The camera swings over to that whiteboard and continues teaching. Thank you. What's the, uh, we've got 25 systems now. Are there more in the pipeline or do we, do we have a, a target for that? Not at this time. Okay. Not at this time. We're, we're utilizing those classes with the amount of students we have that are interested in this. How do we compare to other colleges? I would say that other colleges with bigger budgets um, have have adapted this type of teaching probably more than we have. Um, their systems are a lot larger and more complicated also. Um, so as far as, as far as other community colleges, I would say we're probably ahead of you. We, we, we have spent a lot of time getting these classrooms to the point where there's been a lot of configuration changes, a lot of design changes. In the last three years, we've started, like it says, with the Skype capable conference room with the webcam pointing out to a, to a room like this that has multiple cameras, multiple screens, uh, enhanced speaker systems. This classroom here also has six hanging microphones throughout the classroom that picks up everything. Um, Comparing to ourselves, we've made leaps and bounds. To be quite honest, I don't have an idea of what other colleges are doing. I know that everybody's trying to adopt this and moving forward with this, and it's just really helpful in reaching more students. Jen? I just wanted to share um, earlier this week, I heard from a community partner who's important to this college who said that they love um, using our spaces as their conference room because our tech is so much better. In any other space that they have, any other community space. So it doesn't compare us to other community colleges. I, that was really great feedback to hear. Right. And and the, the a problem that we sometimes run into with that is we have community members or groups showing up wanting to utilize the technology, but don't know how to utilize the technology. There is quite a bit of training involved in these situations in order to be able to utilize this, especially if a professor. You know, walking in and trying to utilize this to teach, you know, and they're doing a week in, week out. You have somebody show up who doesn't know the system at all. We have to provide support for those people in order to walk them through and make sure that they're comfortable with that system. So our AV person will actually show up to events like that if they're not actually providing recording services, uh, enhanced audio, microphone, and stuff like that. We're making sure that people are comfortable. Uh, also, for the fall of 2022, we uh, implemented a Microsoft Teams chat channel. So we have technicians at the remote campuses um, that, that set up the rooms and everything for when people come in. <coughs> um, so this channel gives us the ability to 
have a problem indicated to us in real time. So if there is a problem with the sound in Pineville, the technician gets onto the team's chat and puts in, hey, we're having problems with the sound in Pineville. The ITS AV person will then jump into that system in real time and make adjustments to the sound so that the class can just keep right on moving. So we, we've enhanced our our ability to do that also. So the, the college has embraced this type of learning and it provides another tool to help us reach students. So this concludes my portion of the presentation. If there are no more questions, I will hand off to Mr. McCray. Thank you for your time. Anyone have any questions, uh, Jim or Erica or Oliver? Great. Well, I just say I'm impressed. Yeah, I mean, I'm really happy to hear all this. Yeah, right. I don't have I don't have any questions, but that sounds very um, uh, responsive and efficient, which is um, I, I always hope that for IT, and I don't know that I always feel it in other areas. So good job, you all. It's uh, is a great work. Good yeah. you, weren't, you weren't talking about the college. You were talking about a different institution. Maybe. <laughs> I don't okay. know. <laughs> it's not, I've never, I haven't experienced technical difficulties at the college, so, but I have in other places. <laughs> Thank you. So good evening, my name is Darren McRae. I'm the director for Enterprise Information Services. I work with Jeff and one of two other directors, department, and Jeff's you know, tough act to follow, but I'm you know, gonna do my best here. So first, um, <clears throat> Um, in addition to the student facing project that Jeff outlined, I wanted to highlight a couple of the other projects that IT has completed that we to do. A lot of these are in collaboration with other departments across the campus, um, including the migration from Blackboard, our old learning management system, to Canvas earlier this year. That was in collaboration with e learning and construction. Um, we also did a large upgrade of the works. That's our academic planning tool set for both our students and advisors, and that was in conjunction with student services. And then there was also a, a large career pathway website integration uh, that was in collaboration with curriculum assessment, instruction, and NPR. I don't want to go through this whole list, and this list is not exhaustive by any means, but I did, did want to give you guys an idea of some of the projects we've completed in the past year and some of the partners we've worked with. In addition, quick, quick, the projects, oh, quick question. And this is just, I'm just curious, and it just came to me. I mean, I, and I work for the school district, and I am constantly hearing about upgrades and things like that. I'm just sort of curious, when you talk about sort of a system, you know, degree works upgraded from its predecessor, is that something that just, you just kind of, we got to do this every two to three years, or is there any, is there any program like, hey, this is the this is the gold standard, and we can run with it for five years? I'm just curious yeah. in, your, in your world, how often do you need to upgrade it, and how often do you actually change to different programs altogether? Those are really good questions. So, in the case of degree works, that is actually a component of Banner, which is our ERP or FIS, and it's owned by Lucian. And our version of degree works, um, we've been using older uh, user interface and UI. And so the decision was made by student services to, as part of that upgrade, to include the UI. Um, so that part we could have left alone, but it was working in the plan. They weren't going to be supporting it for much longer. There are other products like Microsoft where uh, they're reducing you know, 75 to 100 updates every month and expecting us to, to implement them all. Um, and their, their schedules are getting tighter and tighter. And I'm going to be talking about cybersecurity here in a few minutes. Um, that is forcing manufacturers across the board to, to take a second look at, at their products and they're constantly patching. So they're um, they're on accelerated schedules that are putting quite a burden on them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah so I, so, I'm sorry, short answer, uh, some of these are uh, user preferences, a lot of these are really user preferences. So, as we completed in 2022, we have quite a list of projects that are currently underway or that it, and the final planning stages to be completed in 2023 and beyond. Uh, some of those include a uh, complete overhaul of our email servers. So we host our own email here on the campus. Um, the server is reaching five years old. Uh, we're going to be replacing both the hardware as well as bring us into the latest operating system or changed uh, operating system for the email servers. 
that's going to be a huge project. Um, Banner, which I just mentioned, is uh, we have a self service portal. So both our employees and our students have been using a portal that is the same user interface has been around for like 15 years. Um, we're going to be uh, upgrading that and hopefully have it in play and ready for release to students by fall of next year. And then um, We've also been working with a, a product called Articulate 360, which is a new user training platform for onboarding new employees, uh, as well as um, training existing employees here at the college. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, and I just want to give you an idea of some of the projects that are that are out there, but um, our actual list is probably four projects. Talk about campus wireless system upgrade. What, what, where is that on a wireless router? Or, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's actually a Jeff question, but um, <laughs> we could have, uh, I was involved in that early on. So we, um, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this. Like, yeah, if you'd like to, yeah. I'd do that. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to get down the phone. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, uh, Our current wireless system is 10 plus years old. We, we, we've gotten our money out of it, and it's to the point where we, we need to upgrade. So when do you make that decision? Speed or is it starting to have mechanical physical problems? It so from a from a network's perspective, it, it's it's based on a few things. For the wireless, if it was up to me, I would run everything till it died. I don't have a problem with that. Welcome to Joe's world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, and in some cases with networking equipment, we can do that. We just keep spares on the shelf, you know, in order to be able to swap that out. In this case. Our wireless controllers, which run the whole show, have internal certificates in them that are expiring. And when, when that happens, then some of our access points don't play. So, so we have to upgrade. For sure. Sure. Thanks. So, the point I'm trying to make is that almost everything we do here at the college uh, involves technology these days, whether it's the wireless network that we just implemented down at Wikia Hall. To communicating with our students through streaming classrooms or email to some of the databases we use for if they are CRM for the banner student information system. What I'd like to do tonight is to take a few minutes to talk to you about what we're doing to secure uh, this growing work with technology. So um, I got a little bit of grief for this. Um, CFCC has always practiced a uh, industry best practice of defense in depth. Well, for security. Um, over the last few years, however, with the move to work remote, we've actually had to begin an initiative to uh, increase that uh, defense in depth stance. Um, so, what we have here, I think it's a pretty good illustration uh, of the defense in depth model. If you can visualize the red computer and the cloud as COCC data in the center of the castle, um, I think it says Pretty good job of developing what I'm trying to what I'm trying to. So um, our first line of defense is our employees. And with ongoing training, um, they're more easily able to recognize attacks like phishing and social engineering attacks. So they're they're on the front line. However, because of the sheer volume uh, of attacks that the college gets on a regular basis, we also deploy an enterprise grade firewall. So this is the same type of firewall we see at Fortune 500 company. This is on our perimeter and does the heavy lifting. Uh, it blocks roughly 90% of all incoming threats before our employees even see, even see them. Um, behind the firewall sits our email gateway. And that email gateway uh, inspects emails that are coming in to our employees for malicious links and malicious content, and hopefully strips that out before I even make it to the employees so they're getting a much safer um, selection of them. We also deploy uh, antivirus to our desktops and to our servers. And then in conjunction with that antivirus, we've um, partnered with a commercial um, security operations center, and they take a, the telemetry from our antivirus and um, use that to help monitor our servers and our network 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So with this model with multiple layers, uh, I believe that we have uh, a model here with multiple layers that um, provides um, safety for our staff and for our students and helps secure our data. So how, how did uh, what did you, how did it, how did it look and work differently with much more uh, remote uh, 
working from home. Uh, yeah, there um, there were a lot a lot of changes. So um, we previously, I'm I'm going to be a little big this because we're streaming, but um, we previously provided uh, access um, for remote desktop for our employees. I'm going to be going into this here in a few minutes, but we're now providing VPN with virtual private networks for more secure connection. Um, that was one method. Um, we chose to use Microsoft Teams for a lot of collaboration. Um, so we had to open up teams to be a more collaborative environment than it was previously. And then um, we started using Zoom. We're actually on a consortium agreement with other community colleges to uh, use Zoom. And they had a, a lot of security announcements when we first um, started getting heavy use. We had to have them fairly regularly because of the vulnerability they had to be on. So we, we just had to address a lot of different vectors that we didn't we didn't have to worry about prior to prior to the remote work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So how do we know that our defense in depth model is working? Um, so our, our enterprise grade firewall that I mentioned just here in 2022, uh, it um, blocked over 780 million uh, unauthorized access attempts at our network. Um, in addition, our email gateway for our employees, it received over 8 million emails incoming. And of those 8 million emails to employees so far this year, it blocked 2.5 million of them as malicious or unwanted. Um, so we know we know our strategies are working in the data environment. We feel comfortable that our firewall, our gateway, our antivirus, and the security operations center in today's environment, um, we've got a, a good defense in depth. But what I'd like to point out is um, that this is not a static landscape, that, that these threats are ever changing, and we're going to require additional investment both time and money to keep up with cyber criminals as the landscape changes. So I realize this is a pretty long laundry list. Um, those are all technology changes. We've also um, are going to be making quite a few changes to the way we do business here at the college. Um, some of these have been mandated by our insurance carrier for cyber insurance, and some of them have been required because of the move from the work. Um, we've made a few of these already, including removing administrative rights from staff computers. So staff can no longer install software, uh, unknowingly installing malicious or unlicensed software without first going through IT. That was a mandate from our cyber insurance carrier this last year. Uh, we've also um, formed some strong partnerships with um, a lot of cybersecurity firms, including several government agencies that are no cost to us. So we have a, a partnership and have worked with uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Um, they provide consulting tools, um, scans of our network, um, recommendations, and then also uh, multi-state information sharing and analysis. Uh, both of those have been, have been helpful to us over the last year or two. Um, in addition, we also uh, have um, formed several commercial partnerships with endpoint detection, response, and monitoring platforms. That was that monitoring piece that was in, in the castle. And uh, these companies, uh, not only do they monitor our network and our servers uh, for threats, but they also monitor the dark web. Um, so we've had multiple not notifications from them uh, of credentials have been leaked. So they will see actually um, student or staff uh, credential accounts that are for sale on the internet. Um, previously, we didn't have any insight into this. So that's one of the, when you asked about changes that have been made, that's one of those where five years ago, it would have been almost unheard of to see this for sale on the, on the internet. And we've gotten, I think, a couple dozen notifications already this year. Um, in addition, those commercial platforms also provide us with um, advanced threat analysis um, and attack um, consulting in the event of something like ransomware or something like that we have, we have their, um, their assistance as well. Um, we're in the final stages of implementing a virtual private network or VPN. Uh, that will provide a more seamless, secure connection for remote employees to connect back to the college, giving them a, um, an experience similar to what here on campus, and um, a more secure connection than what we've had in the past. Um, in addition, we'll be uh, implementing multi-factor authentication. So uh, we use single sign-on here at the college, which means uh, one username, one password between the multiple systems. And um, similar to online banking or shopping, uh, we're going to require to use your phone or another second form of, event, of authorization to get into your account. So this is just a, 
um, another form that everybody can do to uh, help track those accounts and protect so that you can do it. Uh, that's another requirement by our insurance carrier, and I believe we have that in place by June uh, 2023. And then uh, recently, I told you about these uh, password, uh, username and password leaks that we've seen um, on the uh, dark web. And oftentimes, and in fact, most times, they aren't that um, it's a COCC account in the COCC systems. It's that a student or employee has used their COCC email address for another system, and that system is breached, and, the, and, there's, and that address is for sale. So it's not that in almost every instance that we come across, it's not that, that an access into COCC is for sale, it's, it's they use their COCC email address. And what we started seeing was um, that they're using new technology to actually scrape passwords out of people's browsers. So little heads up for anybody here at the table or in the room, um, in the last couple of months, saving your passwords to the browser is no longer a secure form of um, password security. So uh, we're looking at um, password management applications that will integrate with the browser. Uh, and that um, are a little more secure, well, actually, a lot more secure than, than swearing in the browser. All right. Um, I wanted to thank you guys uh, first for giving us the opportunity to present this evening. Um, we, uh, you have to see at the beginning of the presentation that we wanted to give you a glimpse into what IP have been doing to support student success and college operations over the past year. And I'm hoping this gave uh, to give you a little glimpse into that. Um, I also wanted to thank all of the departments that we've collaborated with over the past year. Um, I think um, we've really enjoyed some good relationships with folks across the college, and so, so I want to say thank you. And then um, last but not least, uh, we've got a small but, but dedicated group of employees in IT um, that work tirelessly to support this growing list of technology, and I wanted to thank them as well. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I, I, did, I just yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think on, on behalf of the board, I want or I'll maybe speak for myself. I wasn't able to follow everything that you said from a technical, but, but I think you did a and both of you did a fantastic job of really providing the breadth and helping us really understand the many ways in which technology is completely integrated into all facets of of the, the campuses and the. You know the incredible work that you have going forward, and also examples of where you really have, have stepped up. So I appreciate the presentation tonight and the work of both your teams. Yeah, thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Bruce. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Please. Um, uh, I didn't first, see you guys on the screen, so please jump in. Yeah, phenomenal presentations. Um, I will say I I hate the pass the the fact that I'm uh, always made to change my passwords because it seems to always happen right before I'm trying to sign into a board meeting. <laughs> and then I gotta go run to my computer and figure out how did I change that last time. Um, you mentioned that uh, there you're you're seeing or you're hearing that uh, passwords are now being scraped out of browsers and that's not a good place to save. Passwords. But there's so many different passwords. How 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 do you feel about password management systems? Um, I, I it does make me nervous having all of my passwords in one service because then it feels like if someone gets the password to that service, then they have every password to everything that I log into. But I I find it completely untenable to manage all of the various passwords with so many different rules. Oliver, I, I'm, I'm right there with you, and I've actually resisted using password management myself for that same reason. When it gets in there, and then they've got all your passwords. And what the recommendation these days is is to use one of those password management applications. And that's what we're looking at is password management applications. There are dozens out there, but we're looking for those that will integrate with multi-factor authentication. So you do have that second form of authentication, hopefully on you, that, that you have to approve for them to get access to that account. Um, and then there's the, the choice between uh, password management that's in the cloud and, and having a password manager that you carry around with you on a USB stick. So it could be broken into. Um, but the big, uh, the big technology out there that everybody's talking about right now, and I'm not going to stock in them, but it's YubiKey. So if you, uh, if you were to look at YubiKey, um, they seem to be the leader right now in password management and uh, multi-factor. 
Um, and they, they have a list on their website of all the password application systems that they're uh, compatible with. Right. My other question is, uh, you went through, you have a very thorough sort of look at the multiple defenses in place, but I'm curious about in the unlikely event that um, a bad actor were able to circumvent all those defenses and we were to fall victim to a ransomware attack or, or something, does the college have a plan in place for how to get by during a period of time where the systems are inoperable or inaccessible? So very, very interesting and timely question. Um, the IT department just wrapped up um, a, a, an exercise with one of these consulting firms that I, or part cybersecurity partners that I've talked about. We just finished today, as a matter of fact. Um, the college has business continuity plans. IT has business continuity plans. We are updating and have been updating our continuity plans for six to nine months at least now. And this is kind of the final phase where we were, uh, the exercise we went through and we asked Jen Kovic with uh, marketing publication as well as uh, Charlie Andreessen with risk management. Um, the exercise we went through today addressed just that. What what would happen in the event of ransomware? Right? What's, your, what's your risk tolerance? What's your backup? How long are you gonna be down for? Um, the communication channel to the board and the senior leadership, all of that. Um, it was interesting to see it happening in a live environment, right? It was it was a, a, a two day exercise where we actually went through that scenario um, to see how our documents held up, how our, our thought process held up. And what bothered me most about that exercise was the person leading it said, "It's not if you get hacked; it's when you get hacked." And uh, I just, I feel that we do so much you know, in IT that we should be able to protect ourselves, but the, apparently the cybersecurity professionals out there, the, the mantra is that it's gonna happen to you sooner or later. Um, and I just, you know, I, we're trying to do everything we can to ensure that if it, if it were to happen, we were in a place that it, it was minimal damage and it was uh, mitigated and, and we were able to restore systems in a timely manner. I, um, it, there's so many variables to ransomware these days, you know, from just uh, monetary to um, wanting to be destructive or um, or grab headlines, uh, they, and, they, and they have all different forms of, of attack vectors that it will be difficult. And, and until that day happens, I'm going to knock on wood it doesn't. But um, until that day happens, I, I couldn't tell you, you know, if we're two days out or a month out or six months out. You know, there's uh, you see colleges in the headlines right now that have had to close their doors. I've been there were victims of ransomware and and, uh, and lost all their data and had to shut down. So, um, yes, it keeps me up at night, that question. Great. Any you. other questions? Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate you. that. Moving on to cultural competency, Alicia and Christy are going to be joining us? Uh, no, it's just me. This, year, okay. um, this really is just a short, uh, obligatory, for lack of a better word, required uh, part of the response to legislation that happened several years ago. So this is your every other year update to that particular legislation, which is now part of the Oregon's industry. So happy to answer any questions you might have on that particular report. Well, I like that I saw a lot of nets there, which is good. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just sort of curious, were there some that were more challenging than others? Or another question would be, were there some that were really fun or inspirational as you were able to check the box? You know, the one thing I would say about this report that at least I was pretty proud of the work that we've done at CSTC is when this first came out, I want to say it was six years ago, when it was our third report, um, how many of these that we were already ahead of the curve on? Um, so much so that uh, Christy, myself, and others were asked to work with a consortium of Oregon small rural community colleges who don't have uh, folks in positions like that to help coach them on how they can build this kind of work from the ground up, uh, which is the path that CSDC took many years ago. So I don't know that ones were any more particular challenges, but the exciting part was when we did have to respond to this report, how well CSDC was doing, uh, especially compared to our like size or larger peers. So that was the exciting piece. The other piece in here to me that I think is something to be particularly proud of is the trainings that we've done for years and the more recent expansion of some of those trainings. And that long, long list of things you see um, to me is something for us to be proud of um, and to brag a little bit about, as well as the number of ad hoc trainings that Christy and her team put together in response to individual partner requests. Great, thank you. Who, who, do you who does the college report to on 
What do you send it to? So far, you. Oh, and that's it. The state has not asked us for copies of this report. Oh, really? Um, even before it was codified into an OER. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm glad we're doing it, but it's just like you think that if they're going to require it from Salem, then somebody's going to ask you. Thank you. Jim, Oliver, Erica, any questions? Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on to the Madras standard and update with uh, Jeremy and Zach. Good evening, everyone. Tuning in live and at home, Jeremy Green, director of the Madras Campus and Capital Projects Expansion, is here with us tonight. Um, just want to give you an update on uh, where we stand in December um, and answer any questions, and then we'll go into some of the detail of the resolution from Lori. Um, again, by the numbers, uh, we did a little bit of an increase in projected size for the Madras expansion. Um, Looking at about 20,000 square feet, maybe a little larger now. We're sort of in this rendering phase, and the architects have come out um, and done meetings with all of our program staff. They did one iteration and then went home, did their drawings, came back, and then meetings this week with Jeremy conducted um, to get more feedback. So it's sort of this let's put everything on the board and let's talk about the wish list of what the programs and departments want, and then we'll whittle that down based on availability and space. And, and budget. So um, we are looking at a, a little bit of a larger project site, and that's actually largely because of the child care facility that would be in there, and our state mandate for square footage per child that would be supported. So again, don't get too locked in on that square footage size because of a little bit of expansion, but we think it's a good thing. Again, reminding you four new degree programs, a projection of 88 graduates per year, uh, approximately 100 child care slots. A reminder there's now a three year wait for child care slots in Jefferson County and Madras. Three years. Um, low income students will be 49% represented. Um, program deliverables, again, our early childhood education um, program will be there um, with early learning workforce development, bilingual teaching, the child care center, again, mentioned. Um, so we kind of have that learning lab um, facility so that ACE students can really take advantage of that uh, being on site. Um, health careers, four programs there nursing, nursing assisting, medical assisting, and then that technician program. And then we'll have those science labs. In chemistry and biology, I think some of us have seen a lot of that. That hasn't changed. One that's really changed here is the potential size um, square footage being increased. Questions on that slide? Super. Um, design updates. Again, I alluded to this a minute ago. Opsis Architect, our firm, has held five listening sessions with program leaders from all included disciplines. Jeremy's been great at hosting that. Uh, Anna uses our administrative support that matters to. They really run the show. There's two folks out there. Um, so it's been really great to have them hosting all these meetings and taking tours. I had one of my board members go out and do a tour of the Matters campus too. So just appreciate Jeremy and um, Anna's role in supporting all of that attention that we're putting on the Matters campus these days. <laughs> um, uh, integration of our CSC campus services now underway. Our director of campus services, Josh Claus, and he's pretty new, has, a, has an excellent background in public sector projects, large scale capital development projects. It's really great to have him on the team and meeting with the architects and the program folks early on. So we don't miss any key things from the campus services perspective. And that RFP for our COGC that was approved at last month's board meeting by this body is now live. And we hold our mandatory meeting for those uh, that want to potentially respond to the RFP just yesterday. It matters again, Jeremy and Anna put those folks around, had that mandatory meeting in Charlotte and with the other areas we've been to. Um, how many folks were there during the it's seven. seven firms that were like and Charles said that was a great yeah yeah so excited by that turnout now. um from some of the folks um in the region um my exciting part on funding updates again state and federal we did receive a future ready boarding grant already for nursing equipment that's in uh, we have an informal ask in front of the Jefferson County commissioners that we presented to them um one of their commissioners last month uh, we had some other conversations with the city of Madras, uh, city of Culver, um, and I think the totally is coming up in January, which is really exciting. Um, we have a are, are they, they what, what funds are they looking at? I mean, uh, not, uh, their, not their not their general. Okay, some okay. Of that's why I'm curious. Held over okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, yeah, usually that's what Jefferson County did. Allen's in there. Um, uh, private foundations, I'll leave the, the exact names of those out for this public meeting, but we did have a formally submitted million dollar proposal that went out um, last month that will be considered um, in January. It's largely driven to child care and our ECE program. We have three other proposals in progress that are pretty sizable. Uh, we're finalizing our process for the major impact child care grant. In fact, I think Jeremy was just doing that grant application today, and I don't want to be doing that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so exciting. And then the COCC Foundation. Uh, for staff and board again are sort of prepping for the capital campaign that will come after we know where those other things land. Uh, we have a consultant on board, actually a consultant that helped um, with the culinary campaign has come back to the fold. Um, it's been helping me out just on an hourly basis on the foundation board. We've done a lot of donor and pre-donor meetings and our board readiness to kind of like treat there in September and just getting board members engaged. I mentioned one of our board members sent out to the two of the chairman just this week. So that's pretty exciting too. So just a lot of that planning and getting ready and reaching the skins for what will be a pretty significant um, um, set of asks to our base. Lori? Sure. And I, I think you just said this in your foundation language, but you've been having a lot of meetings with potential individual donors right. to, to talk about the possibility and doing that quietly. So um, these, these gentlemen have been pretty busy and um, at our fall retreat, we had a chance to chat a little bit about what the college's contribution to the actual construction of this facility uh, could be and, and should be, and left you with some thoughts. Um, uh, at the time, the discussion, uh, and I assume it's, it's still the, the goal, is that we would use real estate proceeds um, to uh, fund this contribution. I think um, Zach is, is more expert on these things than I am, but um, we're getting to a time where it would be helpful in our fundraising and in our grant applications to know what the college's number is. Um, as I've reported to you on different occasions, um, the real estate proceeds that we have garnered so far uh, and that we will have garnered through the first quarter in um, 2023 uh, amounts to about $1.8 million. So uh, if we were to donate 10% or allocate the, I'm just, I'm okay, terrible. Obviously, this if we were to allocate a million dollars to this facility, um, that would be a significant uh, chunk of that money. Um, but I'd also remind you that that's only for outcrop one. The only proceeds we've actually seen from real estate um, is outcrop one and the sales of those lots. Outcrop two is out there. <coughs> Neighborly Ventures is out there. Campus Village potentially uh, the Aubrey Butte property. Um, I'm sure I'm, I might be missing something, but we can't know, to totally honest, we can't know exactly what those amounts will be. And I'm not here to say I do, um, but I think, or, or, or a timeline, because we've been really focused as an institution on uh, waiting for the right, the right projects to do in terms of our development. But I think it is safe to say that those are, uh, so th those will be substantial, um, uh, and they they will be forthcoming um, at some point. So, with that, I want to uh, let Zach speak a little bit from his perspective to what our potential contribution might be, and he can much more articulately than I just tried to <laughs> talk about. Um, uh, what our uh, what our what our recommendation would be, which is that um, the board consider um, something as close to a million dollars as it feels comfortable with. So we're not here specifically with an amount, but for various reasons that I'll leave to Zach, um, there are some real benefits to making that amount a little higher uh, than a little less. Yeah. We put a little of that logic in the resolution that you guys have in front of you, but 
again, some of our grant funders, and we did talk a little bit about the same three last fall. Um, there's a threshold with which you can't even take the application. I'm pretty sure you're aware of that 40 to 50 percent for Andre Murdoch and, and uh, Meyer. So getting to that number committed helps us allow, allow us to put those grant requests in. Um, Murdoch is a great example. Like I said, you can have 40 percent of project funds committed before you can do that, which is which is normal. They like to see that other funders have stacked up. We feel like the college itself is an appropriate place to show that early match, if you will. Um, and it also mirrors, again, as I mentioned, the informal requests we put from Jefferson County and taken to the small private foundation at their request um, in the Portland area for a million dollars. So it's 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 in line, it's in line with those requirements. Um, if we were able to come out of January with three to four million committed from those sources, we'd like to be really good. 30 to 40 percent of the potential project costs are getting us there. Um, that we can then go to those other large foundations we would consider pretty significant investment in the project and then have a little bit of sense of what the capital campaign and how they would be cut off as the project would be. So there that that's sort of the overview of that. Uh, it's a little bit of that momentum that we'd like to get to show the college is um, sort of buy into the project overall. I just would also add a fairly interesting dynamics in the last year. Um, it's really um we're really lucky to have that revenue stream. This is not, this would be depleting the funds temporarily. We have other revenues coming, as Lori said, from the other phase of the bound crop, not purely ventures and potentially even sales. So I wouldn't have, it, it, as a fundraising professional, we wouldn't dip into reserves to do that unless it was a replenishing thing. Um, Joe and I were able to talk about this a little lot why if we just talk about the mechanics of that. So those <laughs> funds would be replaced and then. Or we replenish them the next year and beyond. And so we're really lucky to have um, the foresight of other folks that are still in this room and see those revenue streams come to fruition. So that's a little bit of the logic behind um, okay. that that ask. And I would just add, and I, I know I don't need to remind the board that I think the when we talked about those real estate proceeds, I think the and correct me if I'm wrong, really the will of the board is that those be used for growth. For the future or um, new projects. Um, they're not meant to be used operationally, um, that they're an in, they're they're an investment for the future. And so we we think this is um, a lot of things have come together. Um, we think this is a, a good investment, obviously, and um, we've been generously donated land to, to build this facility. That, I mean, that's huge. The Bean Foundation has been with the college first and figured the first campus and then significantly since. Um, we went does that, that count as part of the 40%? It does not. It's not. Um, well, I take that back. For one of the funders, the private funder, yes, for Murdoch, it would have been so. But, but that's the catalyst here. I mean, with the readiness of, of federal and state dollars to fund ECE, to fund child care expansion, in RIPAC, we received, you know, 8.2 million for the state to help move this needle in our communities and the child care desert that is Central Oregon, which is huge. Um, so it's it's what we talked about repeatedly in this body, and again, it's the tree, which was the red, the timeliness is, is there. And again, Jefferson County folks, matter schools are pretty excited about this. So, but that land location is a catalyst to get this moving up. Just we wouldn't be here without the Bean Foundation. Sure. Are there any questions before we move on to board deliberation? All right, floor is open. Um, you've seen uh, the, the staff recommendation is a million or as close to that as we feel comfortable. You don't want to, you know, start start the conversation. Alan? I'll start it. Um, I support the million dollar contribution. Uh, I think uh, we are set up with the funds that, like Lori said, that. These are funds that we want to use towards um, capital improvements, not operations. And, and when you look at what we're doing, is we're standing up one of our satellite campuses with the ability to expand and grow and meet the needs of that community. And we can do it. So we should. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I uh, welcome Laura. I'm sorry. How are you doing? How how was your daughter? <laughs> Terrific, thank you. I'm glad. Uh, Laura made the right choice of putting family above volunteer. <laughs> thank you. Um, I totally I totally agree with Alan. I mean, from my perspective, 
Uh, Lori, I think you were too deferential in how this was being presented. I mean, given that we've already sort of philosophically said we want to keep it within the you know real estate for real estate, this is entirely consistent with what we're doing. I mean, as a grant writer, I totally understand where Zach is coming from. This is all about leverage. We've already got the land. I'm totally supportive of a million dollars. I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, this project, we talk about future expansion um, programs as well as um, education and civic locations. Thank you, uh, Alan, for recognizing the fact that this is a rural uh, campus. I can go back um, 20 years that when we had our city UGBE uh, expansion, we included sidewalks because we knew it was going to be important. Prior to the county building the Juniper for Hills Park and identifying that as an asset that was uh, presented and given by the Bean Foundation, we identified as a, 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 if you will, education benches. That's how I sell that whole area on, on my economic development tours. The county um, extended money into the city along with our expansion on the B Street, which goes east and west, to make sure that it's wide enough for three lanes. We don't use all three of them, we use it for a turnout lane. And of course, the private assets of the Beans brothers turn into a foundation and they believe in education. And the uh, traffic plans have always made education access in and out easily. If you look at the two lanes into uh, junior high as well as in the COCC, they are eight back basically an in intersection. And they, they plan that. I don't know how people think that far ahead because I, I don't have a challenge for, for next year. But the whole thing is a lot of a lot of planning has been going on well before that camp was built 10 years ago. And people believe in education in, in our area. So um, I'd be if I was an outsider saying, well, that's a lot of money. You know, it's almost 60% of what we may get in the next year with the sale of the property you mentioned. But we do have other dollars coming in over the next 10 years. But hopefully that other locations when they are needing uh, programs or expansion that their communities are well set up as well as uh, we've been able to do here in Madison. Anyone uh, joining us remotely? Uh, I'm totally happy with the million dollar figure. And I think uh, as time goes on and the thing, the project gets up and running and, and under construction, uh, we may be in a position to put in some more money, but I think at this point, the million dollar figure sounds right. Thank you. Anyone else? I agree for uh, the reasons uh, my colleagues have well articulated already. I'm in support. And Laura, I'm guessing Prineville will be next or somewhere down the road. <laughs> down the road. As I far am as... taking. I am taking notes. <laughs> yes, that's good. Let's get after it, Laura. I'm ready. Hey, okay, so uh, at this point, it's time. It's time for someone to make a motion. I'll yes. move. I'll move that the college, um, um, the board of directors, approve a commitment of one million dollars from real estate proceeds to the construction of a new facility in Madras. Thank you, Alan. Second. Multiple seconds. Great. Uh, all those in favor, uh, say aye or raise your hands. Aye. aye. Unanimous already, sir. It's awesome. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate well, that. Well, Jeremy, I want you to say something. You haven't said anything, Marley. I just wanted to hear something. I would just say, first and foremost, thank you. Thank you for the support as a matter of citizen myself. Just thank you for that. We already have littles, as we're calling them, in our design programming meetings. Um, I coach for the MAC in Madras, and they drive by the campus now and say, that's my college. And with the addition <clears> of this building and the addition of the, of the early learning center, is what we're calling it, um, as part of this build, they are going to be used raised in Madras that will say, I've been going to COCC since I was born. And that is a, that is a cool thing yeah. um, for a community the size of Madras. The other thing that I would share is for the community the size of Madras, um, this expansion project, the, the, first, the first build, the, the first programs that we were able to bring helped rise the tide of the community as a whole. And this expansion, these programs specifically, um, ECE, health careers, 
our science labs, these are going to rise the tide of the community as a whole yet again. And we are being looked at now within the community as um, part of the economic vitality of the community, part of the community as a whole and saying, um, Madras, we're, we're, we are looked at, I'm, I'm finally getting up there to, to Joe's top five of his tour, um, things to go and look at and drive by and say, you should move to Madras because, and we are contributing to um, the city and the county in, in regards to attracting folks to Madras and keeping folks local in Madras. Julie Downey and I were in a great conversation yesterday with OHSU, who has now heard that we're doing this expansion, and they are looking at bringing their family practitioner residency program into this building, into this program in conjunction with our health careers program. So it's already starting to take shape, and the, the possibilities are, are beginning to grow beyond what we had initially imagined. And so I think that's great for a community of Madras, 8,000 people in Jefferson County. What's the population of Jefferson County? It's 8,000 in the city, more than 2,500 urban growth area. So for a community that size to have the asset that that they will have at the completion of this, that that rises the tide of the community. So thank you, board members, for supporting this. Great, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Alan, for making sure that Jeremy spoke up. Appreciate it. Well, I want to thank Jeremy. I mean, yeah. there's a couple items on our agenda today that Jeremy's had a big part in, and so thank you for all the work you're doing for us. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. And, and he has done an absolutely outstanding job. Um, and we're, we're lucky to have him. And he's leading a really fine team to work on this project. Happy to be part. Great. Thank you. Let's move on to new business. Uh, proposed 2324 room and board rates. Alicia, is Lori joining us? Uh, just me. Just me. Yeah. Um, oh, this lady. Lori, right, there's a thought. Another Lori in there too. Um, yeah, you have before you a resolution for the 2023 to 24 room and board rates. The reason we like to bring this at the December meeting is that we start preparing contracts to go out in late January, early February to students who have expressed interest in that next academic year. So we want to be able to have the rates um, in front of them. It's quite a bit of detail in the resolution. So not a lot more to add to that other just other than to just highlight a couple of the key po components in that we opted to not or recommend to not increase room rates this upcoming year, given the cost of providing food services is increased exponentially um, so much so much more compared to pre previous years. And so that's why you see that balance. The other piece is we do, um, now that we've changed the funding model that we talked about in previous board meetings uh, for uh, student housing, Student housing is now generating a revenue to the institution and not increasing it this year will not substantially impact the revenue that that brings in. Um, and so we're feeling very comfortable, very solid with the revenue that, that the room rates are bringing to the institution. So it gives us the ability to um, lessen the impact to students of what the potential combined room and board rates could be. The meal plan. Um, Increased rates that you see, and I mentioned several of those in there. Uh, Sodexo, our food service provider, did a great job of indexing um, and providing a very itemized detailed list of all the different areas in which they're seeing increases and indexing those to very specific measurements. And so I think I shared just a couple examples in there, but there were probably 17%. Yeah, yeah. But there were about seven or eight different indices that they um, based their uh, proposed rates, rate increases on. So we've got a couple of examples. Other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. You talk about the um, uh, room and board for the um, residence hall is turning, turning a revenue yes. that goes to the college. Room. We do have a dedicated fund where that revenue first takes care of the debt. Yeah, this is this is net. This is net. Yes. This is net. This is net. This is additional income and above so, and beyond. Yeah. All right. Revenue covers the debt payment, it covers housing or staffing costs, it covers all operation costs, utilities, okay. everything that we're paying. Student housing reserve fund as well. Thank you. Okay. So, so I, feel, I feel better now. <laughs> um, when I look at your comparison to other colleges and universities, we compare to universities more than we do colleges. Is our, is our facility just you know, first rate? A true. Uh, yes, and yes, they actually, absolutely. The true comparison is challenging because everybody has so many different models. 
That was my question. Is are we really able to get an apples to apples comparison? The closest on these is probably OSU Cascades. Um, it's also the newest building uh, in, in this list here. The other piece with Treasure Valley Community College and Southwestern Oregon Community College is they are very specific in that they provide student housing in order to subsidize their athletics program. And so they offered a much lower rate in order because they require their athletes to live in. And they, it's an express purpose of housing uh, because housing is so limited in those particular communities. So I list them there as community college comparators, but when you look at the style of the building versus the style of our building, they are wildly but yeah, we, we really do, Ellen. In fact, I was just talking with someone the other day. The design of our suite setup um, has won some national awards because it is so unique in garnering additional space for students. So pretty exciting. I had similar uh, questions from Alan. I came out from a slightly different perspective is that we are tonight looking at 23, 24 um, proposed. So where did these numbers come from? I mean, do we know what they're looking at? Because my question is maybe we're looking at 23, 24, but the numbers here are 22, 23. Yeah. So we, we might not be as, we might not be as bad. The yeah, initial right. outreach to those colleges, we haven't been able to see, they haven't been able to share yet what they're looking for, their rates. Most will approve their rates in February, sometime even doing March and April, okay. and they will send out amended contracts to students with those new rates after students have signed an initial contract, which is not how we have to do our business. I'm really happy to see that we're, this is successful. I know that Bruce worried a lot in the past when we built this building and we were hoping students would come and pay for itself. Bruce had had I, uh, yes, it did, and I'm, it's appropriate to worry. That's part, it's part of our job <laughs> on the board, and and you know we, we need to make we need to make tough decisions. So that's good. Yeah, thank you. No further questions. I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the room and room and meal plan rates. This is Joe. I have a move that we have the board of directors approve the proposed 2023-24 room meal rates. Presented in section A of uh, what's been presented tonight. I'll second. second from Laura. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thanks, that. Everyone. Thank you. Um, Laura, talk about the contract. Is there, doesn't say there's a presentation. Do you want to make some? Comments about that? I know we've got some action to take. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to be presenting anything. <laughs> no, we're just going to talk for a minute. So. Well, you are presenting. So uh, you're, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if everybody knows everyone, but Allison Dickerson is the chair, uh, or excuse me, is the president of the Classified Association. Elizabeth Allison is the vice president for business affairs. Mm -hmm. and Elizabeth was the chair of the classified negotiations team, and uh, Allison was the uh, co-chair. And then Jeremy Green, chair for the management team, and I was the co-chair. So um, that's the group, and so we want to make sure that all of them get acknowledged for their good work. And what we presented in the board uh, packet for your consideration is the outcome. So we're here to present and. Uh, uh, we have the contract here for Bruce, your signature, so we'll make sure that okay. happens before the uh, making a positive assumption that this will be forward. <laughs> but uh, that's ready here for your signature. But the, the resolution outlines a number of the articles, or I don't know what percent, I'm going to say 90. Yes, 90% <laughs> 90 of the contract was in fact open during this um, lead <laughs> opener and a successor agreement. The, the items that I outlined in more detail were those that were economic in nature. And I don't know if you want me to address that um, at this point or if you have already read it, but in terms of the increases for the three years, 2022 to 23, 23 to 24, and 24 to 25. So three years. I mean, is there more than what's in the budget impact no. section? Okay. No. Then I don't, I don't, I don't, I'll speak on behalf of the board. I don't okay. think we need <laughs> Sure. Um, 
So the uh, the other items, let's see if, it, if there's anything else that any of you want to add. We'll just be looking for your approval of the contract in order for us to sign and move forward. It is retroactive. The pay, the pay increases are retroactive to July 1 of 2022. Any questions of Laura or anyone else on the, on the bias? How many members uh, does your union represent? Well, it fluctuates. It's a pretty <laughs> rapidly about 103. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, did you have a question? I, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to have a comment. Thanks to everybody. I know um, this stuff is never easy. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. No further questions, then. I would uh, I would entertain a motion on this. Well, I move that the uh, Board of Directors of Community Central Oregon Community College approves the 2022-2025 collective bargaining agreement between COTC and the Classified Association of COTC as negotiated. Thank you, Alan. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Joe. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by raising your hand or saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, it passes. Thank you very much. You. And I want to echo what Laura said. Really appreciate the work that everybody did. Uh, again, this is one of those things where the journey may not be a whole lot of fun, but the destination mm -hmm. is good. And I think it's very mm -hmm. fair and it shows you. you know mutual respect for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Might I offer just one last comment? Yes. I wanted to just bring up that um, since everyone's at the table, that I want to reiterate the college's commitment to our classified employees. And to, um, as evidenced by uh, you know, this last year, we did a wage study, uh, which on average was 7% for each of the uh, classified employees. And then this one, which this first year was gonna be the toughest year, yes. which has been a little challenging to place people into. So on, on average, 4% increase for employees to place them into a new step schedule. But um, I wanted to just make sure that I thanked both of them for their commitment to helping do that effort, but also thank all of you because um, it, it, it was a, a solid commitment by everybody to uh, consider the, all the work that the classified employees do and uh, their contributions to the college. And in our best way, we tried to, to you know, make that happen, not just by wages, but by relationships and, and doing all the things that you all helped us to do. So thank you. Great. Thank you. There's multiple members of each team that put in a lot yeah. of time. And yeah. I just want to acknowledge them and thank them and, and um, Allison and, and Kara Rell for spending the last couple of weeks doing the housekeeping portion of this yeah. contract. It was, it was pretty <laughs> tedious and pretty time consuming. <clears throat> Allison and Kara Rutherford is not here tonight. I just want to acknowledge their time in the last couple of weeks specifically in getting this to the garden. Thank you, Allison and Kara. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank you for that. that time. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, the next item, this has, this has the Board of Directors operations before the President's report. Is that usually how we do that? I okay. so. Then I yeah. just had a little brain synapse in this fire. Okay, let's do Board of Directors <laughs> activities. I'll start with people who are remote. Um, Erica, are you willing to go first? Yes, I will. And I don't think that I have anything. I'll check back through my calendar. Thank Thank you. You. Thank you. Sorry, Jim, uh, Mike is back on, so I can't. Uh, were you talking about to Jim? I was talking about you. Oh, okay. I didn't hear you. Um, I don't have anything to report. Quick, Oliver. I'll echo Erica and Jim. I also have nothing to report. Laura, are you going to be an overachiever? <laughs> no, but um, I did attend a site visit and meeting with the real estate committee and the city of Bend yesterday on an issue that'll come before the board, I think in January. And I forgot last month to report that I attended one of the Chandler lecture series. And I, it's worth mentioning because it was phenomenal. This was on October 18th and it was Every Brain Needs Music. And it was so good. It was Dr. Larry Sherman from OHSU and it included the Central Oregon Symphony. 
And also soloist Charlene Chi, I hope I spelled, I pronounced her name correctly. She's an instructor at COCC or professor, and she was phenomenal. The whole thing was so great that when a, 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 a um, file of it was emailed out to all of us attendees, I watched it a second time. So really, really well done. And another reason to be really proud to be associated with um, this college. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. I'll pass that on to Charlotte. <laughs> Alan? Well, since I'm uh, representing COCC on the Oregon Community College Association Board, I do have things to report. So yesterday I was in a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, subcommittee of the OCCA along with Christy. I, on Friday, attended the OCCA board meeting along with Lori. And the Wednesday before that, I attended the OCCA um, executive board. Uh, all of those were Zoomed, so I didn't have to go to the Valley. And I think I did the College Affairs Zoom, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Joe? Um, like Laura, I uh, met with the uh, real estate committee meeting, and we do have a, a proposal coming to the board next January. And uh, the site survey was very interesting in regards to the pipeline proposal that's going to, that the uh, city brought to us. And so we got to uh, walk around the snow. And I, I'm proud to tell you, this Flatlander uh, president we have, she didn't slip or fall. <laughs> she came back out. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, uh, minimal, <laughs> nothing formal, but I had a number of conversations with uh, President Chesley on a variety of uh, variety of issues between uh, our last meeting and now. Um, let's move on to the President's report. Okay. Um, I believe Allison is here. Allison, you want to say hello, Allison Platt? Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be here. I'm Allison Platt with the City of Bend. It's it's fun to see some familiar faces. Hey. Hey, Bruce, I'm used to calling you a counselor. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll let Lori kind of introduce the topic, but here to kind of explain a new program that the city of Bend recently adopted. Well, this is, um, um, as, I've, uh, as I've sort of tried to explain to all these experienced city government officials that I have on my board, um, this is a, um, uh, tax abatement um, plan um, by the city to help incentivize affordable housing. And so uh, this was passed by the city council. And now uh, I think Allison and her team gets to try to implement it. And um, she's got a challenge ahead of her because there are a lot of parties who might conceivably collect property tax revenues that won't be collecting those revenues for a what a 10 year period, is it? Yeah, so um I'm happy to jump in whenever you're ready for me. <laughs> I'm gonna take that as a really nice way of saying you need to be quiet, Lori, because I can explain more <laughs> than you. And you can um, so yeah so but I'll I, just oh go ahead. I, I think the overall meta that we want to get to, the overall decision is, how does this board want to give its input into applications for this abatement, right? Yes, that's kind of exactly the question that I have for everyone. So um, just a little yeah. overview of the program. Um, the city recently adopted a multiple unit property tax exemption program, and this is an exemption program that's allowed through state statute that we um, kind of allows a local option. So the city has already passed an ordinance um, to approve this exemption program, and it's in our development or it's in our municipal code already. However, in order for um, an individual development to actually get approved for that exemption, um, we do need up to 51% of the combined levy of the taxing districts to agree by board resolution in order for that exemption to apply to the full tax dollar. And so we have been coordinating with the taxing districts kind of through the adoption process, primarily at the at the staff level. Um, and, and essentially what that looks like in Bend with the tax dollar is um, the city and the school district would represent that 51%. Um, and we've coordinated with the school district and, and they really want to hear from 
the other taxing districts and the other taxing taxing district boards before they consider kind of um, their approval options. And so we recently convened kind of all the taxing district staff to talk about what type of review process um, would you all like to receive. So the way that this program works is um, it it allows for projects that are doing three or more residential units to receive a 10-year property tax exemption um, on their residential improvements. So the land of the project will often will always be taxed and then um, only the residential portion of the improvement. So if they're doing um, if they're doing a commercial component of the project, that's oftentimes um, not exempt. So you know you're not always getting like a hundred percent of the building exempt from paying their property taxes. And we also tried to structure this program so that it was primarily located within our existing tax increment finance or urban renewal district. And any project in that district doesn't have an doesn't have any financial impact to you all because. Um, We've already adopted an urban renewal district that's um, diverting taxes for that area for a period of, of time. And so, but this exemption program does allow for some projects outside of that area. And so we want to recognize that there is a financial impact to you all as a taxing district. Um, and do you want it to kind of hear what your um, desired goals are for, for reviewing applications in the future? I think some taxing districts want to want to have applicants come and present to them. Um, others do not. And so that's kind of the main question for you all to consider. Uh, we want to recognize that there's, you know, these meetings take up your own personal time. Um, and then, you know, it does add kind of time for us as staff to coordinate those. Uh, but we're totally open to doing that if that's something that COCC is very interested in. I have a question. <clears throat> Isn't it true that um, the property tax exemption applies only to owners who are nonprofit organizations. This is a or was that just was that just the tax increment financing thing? Um, so so this program is different in that it does apply to not only just um, affordable housing or nonprofit developers, it does apply also to market rate projects. So, um, we do have some requirements for what developers must do in order to qualify for this program. They have to provide three public benefits, and we have kind of a list of public benefits that are eligible for them to qualify, but they do not need to be a nonprofit organization to qualify for this exemption program um, for, for both this program and our TIF district program. Is, it, is, all would it, would it be, is there a, a middle option where between getting no presentation and getting a full presentation, like, can we get that included in our board packet, but we don't actually have to take someone's time to come and give us a PowerPoint? Yeah, and I'm kind of, I probably oversimplified um, a little bit. So what we've um, already recommended is that all the taxing district agencies would get an opportunity to review all the applications. So as soon as we receive an application, uh, we would notify your staff that we've received that application and give a 60-day um, comment period for you to submit comments on that application. And then we would send all taxing districts the initial staff recommendation from city staff of whether to approve that application, approve with modifications or deny the application. And at that point, um, that's when we're kind of looking for any feedback that you might have to send to us and the school district to review those applications. Um, I think kind of the questions that we have for you all is, you know, you can opt in, you can delegate that to staff or you can all kind of receive those as part of your board packets moving forward. You may only care about receiving them for projects that are outside of that TIF area that have a financial impact. Um, and then, you know, maybe kind of say, we trust the city and the school district for projects that are already within the TIF area. Um, because those don't have a financial impact to us at all. Um, so that's kind of the, the different layers, but we're already recommending kind of a layer of review for you all or your staff um, built into the review process. But we are statutorily required to provide a, a, an approval, deni denial or approval of modifications within 180 days of receiving an application. Did that answer your question, Laura? Great, thank you. 
Any other questions or comments? So uh, to clarify, this applies to any three, any uh, development of three units or larger, is that correct? It's a lot more detailed than that. Um, so we don't allow, um, it's three, a project with three or more units in specific geographic boundaries. So there's, it's primarily oriented in our core area of Bend where the TIF district is, our central business district, which is our downtown, and then some high density residential zoning along 4th Street, um, just adjacent to the core TIF area. And then um, you have to be doing kind of multi-story requirements. So we're really trying to encourage more urban scale development. So you have to do at least two stories on smaller lots or three stories on larger lots, which we define as 10,000 square feet or larger. We don't allow hotels, motels, or short-term vacation rentals to be located on the lots that are taking advantage of this exemption. Um, they have to submit a pro forma, uh, like a project pro forma of their, how much revenue they're expecting to generate from the project and what their costs and um, projections are. And they have to demonstrate that the project wouldn't be feasible but for this tax exemption in order to qualify. And then they also have to provide, and I can kind of share my screen here really quick. Um, they also have to provide three public benefits um, from this list. And one of those public benefits must be what we have kind of defined as a priority public benefit. So that's either providing a very high level of ener energy efficiency within the building. So like a path to net zero building, um, providing more than 10% of the site as a, as a dedicated um, open space or park or plaza space. And that would be dedicated either to BPRD or as a public access easement to the city, um, providing childcare facilities or doing a percentage of their units as either deed restricted affordable housing for the 10 year period of the exemption or deed restricted as middle income which we define as being available to somebody making 120% area median income or less. So it's a little hard to kind of summarize <laughs> really quickly, but um, it is a pretty robust program that we spend a lot of time working with the community to identify the requirements um, that would need to be met in order to be eligible for the program. Thank you. Any other questions? So like, like Lori said and Allison agreed, I think the, the, the primary question before us is to what extent we want to, um, you know, what level of detail we want. Do we want to be hearing the, uh, the actual presentations or do we want to delegate um, that duty to Lori and who she may want to sub-delegate to? I mean, from, from my perspective, I certainly feel I would support delegating delegating that, but I'm curious what other people, uh, what other people feel. Laura. Bruce, I, I, I think, is there sort of a middle ground where we can see something, which I think is what we were getting at, where we could see something in our packet in writing. And then if we, you know, if something particularly interested us or concerned us, we could then raise it at a meeting. Well, I, again, I want to be really clear. What I mean by delegate is delegate to Lori. And I, I also envision us having a conversation where we might say, hey, Lori, these are some things that the board might consider red flags. And some of them you may say, oh, this is a no brainer. I think the board would be fine with this. Or, hey, the board would want to see something like this. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't say that earlier, but I certainly see that that would be something that Lori would have that, um, that additional information or input from, from the board as far as what kinds of things we might want to look at in, in more depth. So essentially, I would become the conduit for that feedback to the city. Hopefully, you'll have someone do that for you, right? Uh, likely, that will be. Uh, and I, I do want to just clarify, um, I wouldn't be asking these folks to present to me. I, you yeah, know, I'd okay, be, good. It'd be a paper review, um, probably by someone else. And um, and and people are going, will it be me, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's not funny. Pick um, me. Uh, um, and then share those with the board. And if there's any feedback that needs to go back to Allison, share it. Yeah, and I will send my you know my summary of the application um, with a staff recommendation from the city. So maybe that can also serve as like a little bit of a conduit of help for Lori as well. Those, those will be sent to the taxing districts um, after I've had time to review the applications. 
I'm curious. We've got you've got five already. Do you have a sense as to how many there might be, or is it too early to tell, or is this going to be three to five a year for a certain amount of time? Yeah, what we've seen from other programs is about you know three applications max in a year. Uh, we have several developers that have um, mentioned interest in this program that I'm expecting to apply within the next year. Uh, we have a project on. I, I don't know if you're aware, but interest rates have been rising significantly. And so a lot of our multifamily projects um, are having a harder time penciling these days. And so we have a couple projects. Um, one is a micro unit development. Um, we have a project that's outside the TIF area. We have a couple projects within the core TIF district um, that are also interested. The Killian Pacific project on um, Industrial Way is looking at this tax exemption program. Um, the Les Schwab redevelopment site is interested in this program. So I do expect um, several applications this first year. I think there's kind of been a pipeline um, kind of waiting for this program to get up and running, but probably one to two applications on an annual basis. Any other, my sense is that's, I think what we want to want to do is to delegate to Lori. And it also seems like this is the kind of thing where we can sort of see how it goes and make adjustments going going forward. It's like now we want we want to see more or provide that feedback to Lori. And there may there may also be individual uh, board members who want to see more than than others. But um, I am I am I capturing the sense of the group that we feel comfortable delegating to? Okay, great. Thank you. Because I don't think we need to take formal action on that or is that? I don't think so. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you very much, Allison, for making everything clear. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I always call Allison for an after meeting where she remediates my understanding. No, no, no. So. no, no. <laughs> it's but it's a complicated you. program. So, and I can send Lori just some information. We just recently launched a website about the program and we have um, kind of a slide deck about the program too. So I'm happy to send those over to Lori if she wants to forward them onto the board. Great. Thank you again, Allison. Good to see you. Okay. Bye. And, uh, could, I, could I add one yes. more thing? Um, we have a really exciting event happening here on campus as part of the season of nonviolence. On January 26, we have a very special lecture happening at the Tower Theater. And tickets will go on sale soon if they haven't already. But I want Alicia to explain who will be there and, and what that event is. Yeah, we just announced this to the public yesterday. Um, and the event is the one of our signature events for the season of nonviolence. Um, and involves the, the title of the event is called Lessons from Our Fathers. And it's with Nandaba Mandela, who's the grandson of Nelson Mandela, and Ilyasa Shabazz, the daughter of Malcolm X. And so it is at the Tower Theater. Tickets are free, but you do need to reserve those ahead of time. The event is live streamed that people can come in person, but um, I have a feeling it's one of those events that will sell out quickly. So if you're interested, um, you can just go on our website, uh, search on season on violence, and you can uh, log in. Great. And I also want to just quickly thank First Story, which is a local uh, affordable nonprofit, or housing non affordable housing nonprofit, and uh, works resources as the primary sponsors that make, make this event possible. It's a very Substantial lift for them and are grateful to make this happen for our community. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Lori? Nope, that's it. Okay. Um, before we adjourn, I just want to let people know uh, about some upcoming uh, dates and events on uh, Wednesday, January 4th, Audit and Finance Committee meeting will be meeting. Uh, our real estate meeting next one will be Tuesday, January 10th. Our next board meeting is going to be on January 11th. And our meeting in February is going to be on February 8th. So great. At this point, I think we are going to adjourn. Okay. Thank you.